upon my face Lord be gracious with the light of your countenance give me peace for I live only to see your face to shine on On my face, Lord, be gracious with the light of your countenance. Give me peace, for I live only to see your face to shine on me. shine on me let the light of your face shine down on my heart and let me feel it let the light of your face shine down on my heart and let
Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Island Community Church. We're glad you're here and, and uh, come in and find a landing spot. And get a lot of visitors, so that's good. And a lot of regulars who are off traveling somewhere, so that's also good. Pray they make it back safely. And uh... All right, let's do this. How many are from Michigan? There you go. All right. I knew it. <laughs> Ohio. I know we got some Ohio. Look at this. All right. Why is it that the Midwesterners always end up here this time of the year, huh? <laughs> there you go. Hey, Gary, did that photo ever come up yet? No, okay, we're going to show you a photo here in a couple of minutes. But I, uh, uh, 7 o'clock last night, actually, let me, let me do this. i got to back up. Sorry, rambling here on you. Um, 
We have done a wedding in two parts, and I haven't really announced this properly, but tonight, today rather, I get to announce this properly. Bruce and Jamie are now completely married. We did all of their celebration last night. But just as we were getting ready to, to do this knot tying ceremony, and thank you, Gerloffs, for being so gracious and allowing all of us to take over your, your patio last night and all that. And, but as we were doing this knot tying ceremony, at exactly 7 o'clock in the night, we get a post from Troy standing in his full military garb with his kids all around him hugging on him and his wife hugging on him and little Ella, the youngest one, looking up at him like, is that really daddy? So he made it home safely from Afghanistan and we are thrilled. And <laughs> so I, I see that photo and that I'm trying to concentrate on doing their ceremony and it was a bit of a challenge. <laughs> but we are thrilled. It took, uh, took a week to get home the way that has to work. Helicopter flights from one part of Afghanistan to another part of Afghanistan to uh, another country to Russia, Russia to Germany, Germany finally to the United States and he made it home safe and sound. So thank you for praying for him and, and uh, made, uh, made a great finishing off of, uh, of a Christmas holiday so we're grateful for that. Well welcome to each and every one of you. We're thrilled. I don't, got so many visitors, I know we'd never get through all of the list. Is there anyone from another place other than Michigan and Ohio that I, that I skipped over? Where, where? Uh, Indiana. Indiana, oh yeah, okay, Indiana. <laughs> yes. Tennessee. Tennessee, all right, that's good. What part? What part of Tennessee? East Tennessee, East Tennessee? Johnson City? Yeah. But, okay, Knoxville, okay, all right. Well, Mike Young, back over there somewhere in Fran, are from East Tennessee, Johnson City, Elizabeth, and Hampton. So, good to see you. Welcome. Yes, sir. Virginia. Yeah. Wonderful. Good to have you. California. California. Wow. You may get the prize for the longest trip, huh? <laughs> Sorry, you're off the radar. Wow, Gagway, Alaska, that's wonderful. Is it colder there or here? Colder there. Okay. <laughs> hey, Shane. Who, who? Houston. Wow, awesome. Good to have you guys. Wonderful. Did you, did you get out before the snow hit the other day? My daughter sent me pictures from Dallas with snow all over the ground and the, my grandkids out playing in the snow and all that. I went, Dallas? Wow. Well, good to have you. Welcome. Anybody else? Anybody? Yes, sir. I didn't hear where that Where? Oh, okay. Glad that you're here and glad that you're safe. Wonderful. Good. Thank you, translators, for getting that message down to me. Really? So you guys did the same thing? Now, you've been here before, haven't you? That's what I thought. I thought I saw a familiar face. Well, welcome. Welcome to all of you. We collectively W snowbirds. So <laughs> glad that you're here. Well, let's stand together and uh, let's look around, find someone you don't know, greet one another, make everybody feel at home here just in the name of Christ. Let's do that. Let's sing together. 
what you say, Lord, it's you gave me life and I can't explain just how much you mean to me now, but you saved me, Lord, give all that I am to you, that every day I could be alive to change your name. Every day, Lord, I learn to stand up on your word and to pray that I, I might come to know you more, you would guide me in every single step I take that every day I feel like I see your world every day, it's you I live for every day, I follow after you every day, I walk with you. Thank you, God. Amen. Well, Tony, I want you to know I'm impressed today already. Uh, he said he was going to put up a picture, and I'm thinking, okay, is this going to be like watching the news and to say, in, in, a few, in a matter of minutes, we're going to tell you about, and then I'm there like, I wait for the next break, you know, and then, then, they, and then I watch for a while, and I don't see the story I'm waiting for. I wait through another commercial break. I still don't see it. And, of course, they've got up to, what, 60 minutes so they can, they can keep the story hanging. And we've already seen the picture, but you didn't talk about it yet. So, so it's keeping us hanging a little bit here. But anyway, I was impressed. At least we've already seen one of the pictures. So, all right. Uh, this next song we're going to do, we're going back a bunch of years. This is back about 10 years post-Civil War days. And this song, we're connecting with people as we sing this song that even back in those days, they were connecting to their God. They found relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ the Son. And so we're going to join together with believers from a long time ago as we sing to God be the glory. <clears throat> The Gospel of John, there's a, there's a passage which from it we can see that God himself made himself flesh. It says God became 
became flesh and dwelt among us. And then, of course, he gave his life so that we could have forgiveness. And this next song, we've only sung it once before. It's a, it's a pretty new song. But it's about Jesus. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. And, and though Christmas was about a week ago, we celebrate all year long that our Savior came. He came to give his life. He is God with us. <clears throat> God, we thank you. We thank you today, Jesus, that you came into our world. You came to give us life. You came that we could have freedom. Your word says that if the Son will set you free, you will be free indeed. And God, there are, are those of us here today that need your help to be free. We need your help to be free from, from the past, to find your hope in the past. We need to have your freedom today over things that are holding us bondage in bondage. And so, God, we come to you for freedom. We come to you for hope. We thank you, Jesus, that you've come to, to heal us. You've come to give us life. You've come to fill us with your love so that we could learn to love well because you've loved us in a greater way than anyone ever has because you've given your life for us. And so, God, as we sing, we, we come to you, Jesus. We want to come to the cross. We want to bring all of our past, all of our present, as well as all of our future to you right now. And say, God, thank you for calling us. Thank you for knowing each one of us here today, that you care about each one of us. And God, you want to bring us hope and life and freedom. And so we thank you in Jesus' name.
the same God that was crucified is calling us all by name. You are calling us all by name. You take the faithless one aside and speak the words you are mine. You call the sin again. Come to me now, the same love that set the captives free, the same love that opened eyes to see, is calling us all by name, you are calling us all by name, the same God that spread the heavens wide, the same God that Crucified is calling us all by name. You are calling us all by name. Oh, 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 You're calling, you're calling, you're calling us to the cross. You're calling, you're calling, you're calling us to the cross. The same love that set the captive free, the same love that opened eyes to see is calling us all by name. To spread the heavens wide, the same God that was crucified is calling us all by name. You are calling us all by name. Oh. God, we thank you. Thank you for your amazing love. Thank you for your amazing sacrifice, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please be seated. Well, I'm going to ask uh, Trevor to come on up here in just a second. But I, I want to thank all of you that were involved and participated in, uh, in the Christmas service, especially Christmas Eve. I felt like that was a, a grand slam home run. You guys did a great job, great responses uh, with all the response cards and all of the uh, folks that put up. This, by the way, is not a mistake. Um, if I had my way, we would celebrate Christmas right up to Easter. We'd celebrate Easter right up to Christmas, and we would just keep cycling right through that. You know, that would just be the way we would do it. So, so you'll see why in just a minute that I wanted to leave everything set up just the way it was. This wasn't a mistake. We didn't forget to take everything down. Uh, that poor tree out there in the lobby, this is about the last possible week it could possibly survive. If you, if, if you have an increased body temperature, please don't get too close to that tree. I'm afraid it would ignite. So uh, it is, we just are grateful for, thanks all of you for, uh, for just helping the services to be what I wanted to be and what God wanted to be, I believe. And Trevor, why don't you tell us about what's coming up this week and then uh, pray for the offering for us. All right, we are very excited to announce today the grand opening of our new Kids Church program. So uh, that is for the existing kids who were in the four and five class and then on up through sixth grade. 
We're going to do things a little bit differently now. Uh, right after we pray, kids are going to exit out of the back door, around out of the side door, and then up the steps into the new surf shack. By the way, if you haven't seen the surf shack yet, come and check it out. We've uh, had a lot of great volunteers that work very, very hard in there to do that. But we're just trying to bring some new energy and some new life. And as Pastor preached um, uh, about a month or two ago, everything that we should be doing around here should be bringing God glory. Every change that we make, every effort that we put forth, it's all to bring God glory. Amen? Amen. All right. So afterwards, yes. Afterwards, what we're going to do, parents, if you would, you will come upstairs to come pick them up. We're going to have registration forms. We just need their information and birthdays and everything like that so uh, we can get everybody's uh, info. So uh, if you would just bow your heads, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you. Thank you for purpose. Thank you for calling, Lord, that you've called us to the cross, Lord, that you have drawn us closer to you. Lord, I just pray that as we make changes around here, Lord, that they are... Every single thing that is done is glorifying you. Lord, that everything we do, every bit of money that we put forth, every minute that we use of our time, Lord, that it bears fruit. Lord, that everything is focused to bring people, lost people, closer to you. So, Lord, I just pray for this offering this morning as people give. Lord, I just pray that they give with open hearts. Lord, knowing that this money, these resources, this time will be used for your service and to bring you glory. Lord, and we ask all of this in your awesome and precious name. Amen.
us to trust you. Help us to praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Well, as I said, we left all of the gifts up here because we want to be reminded of the gift. And that gift doesn't stop just because we've celebrated Christmas Day and then that's it. Um, you know, this sounds, sounds like a shameless infomercial for, for some of you. Um, uh -huh. Aha! <laughs> that was nice, a little background music, you know. How many of you have ever heard Evie Hill uh, preach? How many of you have ever heard Evie Hill's son play the organ behind him while he's preaching? That would drive me crazy. He'll be speaking, and right in the middle of something, he'll go. <laughs> First time I heard that, I went, What in the world is that about? But. Anyway, that was sort of that response. Um, I started to say, shameless infomercial here. I know some of you, uh, because of taxes and all that, have asked about year-end gifts. Well, you have one more day. So if you need to get in. By the way, just understand that the reason you give is not because you get a tax break. <laughs> because you understand the day could come when all of that kind of stuff stops. And then it'll be a real test to see who is giving because it's what God has called us to do. And uh, now, I'll tell you something that Colleen and I do. I'm not, I don't want to high pressure you uh, or make you feel like, oh, I can't do that. We have historically, uh, because of what it says in the Old Testament, always tried to make sure that when we give, it's from a first fruits offering. You know, I don't know about the rest of you, but if I waited until the end of the month to decide how much I was going to give God, it would be based on what kind of income and how my bills were for that particular month. I don't do that. You see, all throughout the Old Testament, people were told to give a first fruits gift. In other words, what God says, I want the gift, the, the best. Don't bring me your lame and sick and, and feeble animals. I want the best of your flocks. And you say, well, that was kind of weird. Well, when you get to be God, you can call the shots, okay? But for me, giving a first fruits gift is, is the right thing to do. So next week, one of the things that we want to do is we want to start New Year's right, and I want to encourage you, really think about your gift next week and make sure that, that you know, it's a proportionate first fruits offering that says, God, we love you, and we want to start the year right. We want, we want to keep the locust away. <laughs> and uh, so that's just my prayer, and we pray that we will do well with that this, this week. You know, I want you to watch a clip and be thinking about the fact that it's kind of a downer, isn't it, after the Christmas morning has gone by? You know, we, uh, we do the little candle and sing Happy Birthday Jesus this year. One of my grandsons saw you was over and we sang Happy Birthday Jesus and he got to blow the candle out. And, and it wouldn't matter whether saw you was there or not, by the way. We do it as adult, adults. But, but anyway, we open gifts and read the Christmas story and do all of that. And, and then the morning is kind of over. And you go, oh. So what now? Well, let's watch this clip, okay? And we'll see.
So what's left of your Christmas? Everything's over, so you don't think about it until next year. You know, one of the things that has for years baffled me and aggravated the daylight side of me is, is how quickly we go from Christmas, and then it's as if we forget about Christmas or as if the evil one gets in and just stirs the pot And forgive me for saying it quite this this way, but it's like all hell breaks loose for New Year's. And I just go, come on, how how can you be worshiping Jesus one minute and be blowing the stops out the next at New Year's? There's a complete disconnect to me. It's like, okay, we did the religious thing, now we get to do the party thing, and what a way to start your year. So that's just my two cents on that. So um, my title for this week is After the Tension and the Glitter Are Gone, It's Still All About the Gift. Not these gifts, but the gift about Jesus. And so with that in mind, as we get ready to launch into a new year, How do we align our life? What's next? How do we align our life with the life of Christ? And I came across another clip. We're going to watch this clip and one more today um, that gives you a pretty good just outline to follow. And I thought, wow, I want everybody to see this because it's so simple and it's so easy to remember as we go into the next year. If we could take care of these areas, it would really... uh, make things work well for us. So let's take a look at this, uh, this next clip. Complicated. Burdensome. Stressful. Pressure. Impossible. Baffling. Intangible. Alienating. Confusing. Clear. The profound things that Jesus taught are at their core clear, and simple. Centered around three key relationships. Up, in, and out. Up, a relationship with God. Grow it. Give it time and attention. Give Him time and attention. Because He first loved us. He is worth it. He is first. In, it's us. You, me, all of us. Together. Not the programs. Not the building. Not the schedule. We, All of us are the church. And they will know us by our love. Our love for one another. So get your hands dirty. Serve. Challenge. Build up. Go deep. Go deeper. Together. Live in community. So they will know us by our love. Out. Look around you. The mission is here. And here. And here. So go. Wherever there's brokenness. Uncertainty. Despair. Indifference. Wherever people don't know the love of Jesus. With God, we can be restorers. Offering faith, hope, and love. This is our mission, to go. So go. Up, in, out. God, community, mission. Align your focus around these three relationships. And grow. Grow as a follower of Christ. Grow with us. Here you'll see that nobody is perfect. Everyone's welcome. And anything is possible. So what were they? Up, in, and out. Isn't that a great way to remember that? You know, it starts with making sure that our relationship with God is is where it should be. Uh, And then the inward examination, both individually and corporately. That in was talking about obviously the body of Christ and being engaged and involved in, in the body of Christ locally. Uh, so that's, you know, that has twofold aspect. And then outward referring to mission, to reaching out into the world around us. And so let's keep that in mind as we go into this year. Um, just served as a pretty good reminder. What is it again? Up, in, and out. Okay. Psalm 33 says, in terms of the upward part, we wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help 
and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. You know, we hope in a lot of things. We were talking the other day around my house about how once again, if the Congress and the President don't come to terms, you know, we are going to be down the tubes in terms of the economy. And it, if you got real angst about that and, and very nervous about it, you know, you could find yourself just having a major ulcer. But when we look at this, we go, wait a minute. Our hope is not in the government. Our hope is not in the economy. Our hope is not in the physician. Our hope is in the great physician, the great economist, the creator of this universe. And we must recognize that. So and that doesn't just happen by, by accident. It takes work to build your relationship with God by being yielded to him and by spending time every single day with him. We call that, you know, collectively, we call that spiritual disciplines. You know, getting into his word, listening and thinking about the things of God. We were talking in Sunday school class this morning about uh, Colleen was watching my oldest grandson, Caleb, um, the one whose dad just, just got home from, from Afghanistan, and he was laying underneath a swing at a playground and was just kicking the swing. And he just kept doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it. And, and Colleen finally said, Caleb, what are you doing? And he said, I'm just laying here thinking about God. And when I get on the phone with him, it's, it's like I'm talking to a seminary student. <laughs> Olivia came home one day, and he's 10 years old now. Olivia came home, and, and after the conversation was over, my daughter-in-law said, who are you talking to? And I said, oh, that was Caleb. And she said, you're kidding me. She said, I thought you were talking to another pastor. I said, no, pastors don't ask those kind of questions. <laughs> I mean, they were, they were hard questions. They were good questions. They were questions that a 10-year-old will ask because nobody ever told him he shouldn't ask him about God. And they weren't afraid to challenge God. And so I, I, I think that is a reflection. I think that's what God meant, what Jesus meant when he said, unless you come like a little child and come with that kind of faith, you're not going to get it. One of our, the major obstacles to this up, in, and out relationship um, with God is, for lack of a better word, something I would call regret. Um, or maybe it's feelings of guilt uh, kind of go hand in hand, don't they? Or feelings of unworthiness. I know, I know people who are imprisoned. It, it usually goes something like this. They've done something that they think has either disappointed God, themselves, a parent, sometimes a, a parent that's been dead a long time and they're an un unpleasable parent. You could never please them. And so they spend a good part of their life walking around going, I am just worthless. And so there you have regret and guilt and unworthiness. And it just really gets in the way of being able to focus upward on God. It gets in the way of looking inward because it's just so painful. And then you don't even think about others and reaching out because you end up with the who am I and I'm not worthy to be doing anything. Let me just, for the record's sake, for all of us, in terms of God and in comparison to God, that is true of all of us. None of us are worthy to be doing whatever it is that God has allowed us to do. We have to be thankful for every breath that he gives us, for every opportunity that he gives us, and say, okay, God, you are using a broken vessel to accomplish your purposes, and I thank you for that, and I thank you for your grace, and I thank you for your mercy. Um, again, I want to watch you, want to have you watch one more clip. And then we're going to talk about what we can do to gain victory over some of these feelings. So let's take a look at this clip dealing with regrets.
All right, so how do we go about that? Let me read a, a section from a book by John Ortberg that, uh, called Who Is This Man? Referring to Jesus. Because of Jesus' emphasis on the heart, goodness does not begin with right behavior. Goodness doesn't begin with right behavior. It begins with openness to the truth about the mess of my inner being. If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. John 8, 32. The truth, as one of our presidents told us, the truth will set you free, but first it will make you miserable. James A. Garfield said that first. John Hartberg said it secondly. Isn't that the truth, though? The truth will set you free, but boy, sometimes when you have to deal with truth, it can just make you absolutely miserable. Let's try a thought experiment. Imagine picking up your car from a tune-up. The technician says, this car's in great shape. Clearly, you have an automotive genius to take care of your car. Later that day, your brakes don't work, and you find out that you're out of brake fluid. You could have died. You go back to the shop and ask, why didn't you tell me? Well, I didn't want you to feel bad. Plus, to be honest, I was afraid you might get upset with me. I, I want this to be a safe place where you can feel loved and accepted. You'd be furious. You'd say, I didn't come here for a little fantasy-based ego boost. When it comes to my car, I want the truth. How about another one? You go in for a checkup. Doctor says to you, you are a magnificent physical specimen. You have the body of an Olympian. You are to be congratulated. And later that day, while you're climbing the stairs, your heart gives out. You find out later your arteries are so clogged that you are one jelly donut away from the green ripper, reaper. You go back to the doctor and say, why didn't you tell me? Well... I knew your body is in worse shape than the Pillsbury Doughboy, but if I tell you stuff like that, they get kind of offended. It's kind of bad for business. They don't come back anymore. I want this to be a safe place where you feel loved and accepted. You'd be furious. You'd say to the doctor, when it comes to my body, I want the truth. Now, you draw any connection there? The same thing is true about the church. So many people come in and they say, you know, we just want a place where we can feel safe. And I want people to feel safe. I want people to come and feel safe and to be able to ask their questions and to be able to explore the things of God. But I don't want people to be able to come in and feel safe and wallow in their sin. And there's a huge difference. I don't want people to always come in and necessarily walk away saying, oh, it's such a wonderful place because they made me feel so good. Listen, you can feel really good and die and go to hell. So sometimes the truth will set you free, but in the meantime, it may make you very miserable as you have to deal with truth. We should never, ever make the mistake. And this is a mistake that a lot of people make about Jesus. We should never make the mistake that Jesus is some cute little religious symbol or some doting, senile old man in heaven that really is fairly powerless and doesn't have much influence on the world and simply went around teaching, be nice, be good. No one ever got crucified for a message, be nice, just be good. Jesus got crucified because he turned the religious world upside down 
People said when Jesus spoke, he spoke as one with authority. He spoke the truth, and the truth was making people miserable before it set them free. And people had a choice they had to make. Am I going to listen to the message and accept it and believe it, or am I going to turn and run from it? You know, my role here is to speak the truth of Scripture, not my opinion. And I try to separate my opinion from, from Scripture when, when we have to deal with that. But if it, if it makes someone comfortable or makes someone regret or feel guilty, for a time being, as they are working toward dealing with the inner stuff, that's kind of my job. So please don't ever come to church and go, well, you know, I just want a place where I can feel good and comfortable and where the pastor tells funny jokes and smiles a lot. That's not the purpose of church. The church is a place where you go and you deal with the truth. Remember the old... The, great Jack Nicholson line from A Few Good Men. Truth, you can't handle truth. Well, sometimes we have to wrestle with that. Look at what the Bible has to say about how God uses regrets. In 2 Corinthians 7.10, it says, God sometimes uses sorrow in our lives to help us turn away from sin and seek eternal life. We should never regret his sending it. But the sorrow of the man who is not a Christian is not the sorrow of true repentance. It does not prevent eternal death. I love the way that's worded. In the message, it says it this way. Adding verse 9 to it, the Apostle Paul is speaking. He talked about he was sorry that people had, had to feel bad for a while. He says... But now I'm glad, not that you were upset, but that you were jarred into turning things around. You let the distress being, bring you to God, not drive you from him. The result was all gain, not loss. See, when you feel regrets, when you feel shame, when you feel like, oh, God, I'm just worthless. Let that drive you to God. Distress that drives us to God does that. It turns us around. It gets us back in the way of salvation. We never regret that kind of pain. But those who let distress drive them away from God are full of regrets. They end up on their deathbed, in a deathbed of regrets. That's from the message. That's uh, 2 Corinthians 7, 9, and 10. But see, here's the good news. If, if you're here today and you, this is all like, oh, that's pretty uncomfortable stuff you're dealing with. Look at what it says in 1 John 1, 9. It says, if we confess our sins, what does it mean to confess your sin? It means to agree with God. Say, okay, God, I recognize it. I see it. I recognize that it is this thing that has driven your son to the cross, has caused him to give his life for me. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from how much unrighteousness? All unrighteousness. That's the work of Christ on the cross. How important is that for us to grasp? There is no reason to live in constant regret or constant self-condemnation, or constant shame. You recognize your forgiveness, and you move on. You know, we used to illustrate this. That communion table over there was made by one of the uh, patriarchs of the Upper Keys, one of the Russell family, years and years and years ago. It's all made out of driftwood. It's laminated together. And it's, it's been here at Island Community Church probably since maybe 1970, maybe even before then. But if I took a, a, a railroad spike and a sledgehammer and I went over to that table and in a fit of anger, I went, 
bam, bam, bam. And I drove that railroad spike into that table and I said, oh, what was I thinking? That was really stupid. And I got out the putty, I pulled the nail out and I got the putty out and I puttied that hole over. Most people would come and they'd look at the table and if they looked at it closely, they might say, what's that big putty hole there? Well, that's where I blew it and I put a hole in it and now it's puttied over. You confess your sins. He says he's faithful and just to forgive us all of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That doesn't mean that the scar won't be there. But that's kind of how you have to look at it. You see it as a scar and you go on, recognizing that now the penalty for that, the scar from that, the, the pain of that is now all resting on Christ and what he did for us at Calvary. You, you can't take away the consequences of sin at times. The result is there. It's still visible. But you can still be forgiven. Three things I wrote down as I was working on this, and I've been thinking a lot about it just this week. There will be no regret for doing the right thing. You have a choice to make. All day long, you're making choices, aren't you? If you will remember whatever it is that's the right thing to do in that moment, you do it. You're going to save yourself a truckload of grief. You know, an old preacher friend that influenced me significantly from Highland Park Baptist Church in, in Chattanooga, Dr. Robertson, used to say, you never sacrifice on, on, the, uh, what is it, on the altar of the temporary, the eternal. Boy, that's a good thing to remember. You never sacrifice. Ooh, this would be so good in this moment. But is it the right thing? Is it the expedient thing? And if it's not the right thing, if it's not the expedient thing, you say, okay, I can't do that. You know, the story is told about Abraham Lincoln one time. He, had, he didn't drink. And Abraham Lincoln was riding in, in the height of the Civil War and things were going really bad and both sides were losing tremendous numbers of troops and, and he was taking a lot of criticism and and uh, the Union Army was not doing well. And he was riding with one of his commanders in a carriage. And the commander pulled out a flask and he said, Mr. President, I know things are going rough. Would you like to join me in a drink? And the story goes that President Lincoln said, Sir, I am tempted to do so. But I promised my mother on her deathbed that I would never let a drop of alcohol touch my lips. But I'm tempted. So if you want me to go against my mother's, the promise I made to my mother, then hand me that flask. And of course, the officer put the flask back in his pocket and they went on. See, he knew what would happen. But it was tempting. It was tempting. You will never regret for the long term. And let me, let me back up on that and say, there are times you'll do right and you're going to feel like in this world you get kicked in the teeth <laughs> for doing right. Well, guess what? In the eternal picture, it's still the right thing to do. And so you've got to keep the right perspective on that. So that just uh, is, is something that's been driving me and I've been thinking a lot about that recently. The next thing is this. There will be no regret for taking the higher road. Do you know what I mean by that? Somebody, uh, somebody cuts you off in traffic. And you got two choices. You can flash a universal sign of peace and love to him. And then he, as he drives by, you recognize that it's one of your church members. <laughs> or vice versa, they do the same to you and realize that it's their pastor. That actually happened to somebody one time. 
Can you imagine that, how embarrassing that would be? Um, or you can take the higher road and just go on. You will, you will suffer financial loss. You may suffer some emotional loss. But if you will take the higher road, you will in the end be the one who will receive the honor and the glory because it goes to God and it comes back to you and you'll have no regrets. I've never regretted taking the higher road. Now, sometimes it's hard to know. So that's where you dig into Scripture. That's where you follow biblical principles. And you follow those guidelines and you say, this is the higher road. You bathe it in prayer. But the higher road is always the road to take. Some of us have a higher road that we need to take with family members, don't we? We could blast them. We could criticize them. We could separate ourselves from them. Is there a higher road that should be taken? Some of us have gone through miserable marriages. I'm not going through a miserable marriage, by the way, just for the record. But, but some of you have. And you're constantly in turmoil. There is a higher road to take. It doesn't involve revenge. It doesn't involve spite. So you've got to work that out. You've got to think about what is the higher road that I have to take here? What is the higher road that I should take that would honor God? That's, see, that's the key thing. You will have no regrets if you live your life in such a way that you're always trying to honor God with your life. You'll have no regrets. And one last thing. There is no regret for saying I'm sorry or for saying will you forgive me did you ever blow it just flat out blow it how many of you have ever had something just come out of here and you go oh I wish I could pull that back and it's gone and you just you wish those words would have never gotten out of your mouth. You're too late. You've said something in anger. You've said something that's cutting and critical. How do you deal with it? <laughs> you say, I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? And then you take it like a rat. <laughs> no, I mean, sometimes, here, you know what we do? I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? But, no buts, all right? No buts. You don't need to justify. In fact, that's just going to get you in trouble. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? Period. And then deal with what has to be dealt with. Forgiveness is tough. Receiving forgiveness is tough. But as we're wrestling through the up, the in, and the out aspect of following Christ, we have to do these things. Let me, let me read you a story. One of the best stories about taking the higher road, doing the right thing, and asking forgiveness that I've ever heard. Remember Corey Tinboom, the hiding place? gracious, gracious woman kept in one of the most horrific German concentration camps during World War II, lost her sister in Ravensbrück concentration camp. They did horrific human experiments in this concentration camp. So I did some research on it this week, and I was looking at pictures, and I, pictures I couldn't even post, things I wouldn't expose you to that just made my stomach turn. I thought, oh, man. How could another human do this to someone? To thousands of people, tens of thousands of people, millions of people. And Corey Ten Boom, of course, is a Christian. 
she survived the war and then spoke until and passed away in 1983. Here is a story from her. It was in a church in Munich that I saw him. A balding, heavyset man in a gray overcoat. A brown felt hat clutched between his hands. People were filing out of the basement room where I had just spoken, moving along the rows of wooden chairs to the door at the rear. It was 1947, and I had come from Holland to defeated Germany with a message that God forgives. You think about what it must have been like to be in Germany right after the war. It was the truth they needed most to hear in that battered or that bitter, bombed out land. And I gave them my favorite mental picture, maybe because a sea is never far from a Hollander's mind. I like to think that that's where forgiven sins were thrown. When we confess our sins, I said, God cast them into the deepest ocean, gone forever. The solemn faces stared back at me, not quite daring to believe. There were never questions after a talk in Germany in 1947. People stood up in silence, in a silence collected their wraps, and in silence left the room. And that's when I saw him. Working his way forward against the others, one moment I saw the overcoat and the brown hat. The next, a blue uniform and a visored cap with its skull and crossbones. It came back with a rush, the huge room with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor, the shame of walking naked past this man. I could see my sister's frail form ahead of me, ribs sh sharp beneath the parchment skin. Betsy, how thin you were. Betsy and I had been arrested for concealing Jews in our home during the Nazi occupation of Holland. This man had been a guard at Ravensbrück concentration camp where we were sent. Now, he was in front of me, hand thrust out. A fine message, Fräulein. How good it is to know that, as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And I would have spoken so glibly of forgiveness. I, who had spoken so glibly of forgiveness, fumbled in my pocketbook rather than take that hand. He would not remember me, of course. How could he remember one prisoner among those thousands of women? But I remembered him. The leather crop swinging from his belt I was face to face with one of my captors and my blood seemed to freeze. You mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk, he said. I was a guard there. No, he didn't remember me. But since that time, he went on, but since that time, I have become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things that I did but I would like to hear it from your lips as well. Fräulein, again, the hand came out. Will you forgive me? And I stood there. I whose sins had again and again and again been forgiven. Whose sins had to be forgiven and could not forgive. Betsy had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply for the asking? It could not have been many seconds that I stood there, that he stood there, rather, hand held out. But to me, it seemed hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I had ever had to do. For I had to do it. I knew that. The message that God forgives has a prior condition, that we forgive those who have injured us. 
If you do not forgive men their trespasses, Jesus says, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. I knew it not only as a commandment of God, but as a daily experience. Since the end of the war, I had had a home in Holland for victims of Nazi brutality. Those who were able to forgive their former enemies were able also to return to the outside world and to rebuild their lives, no matter what the physical scars. Go into a illustration of the table a moment ago. Those who nursed their bitterness remained invalids. It was as simple and as horrible as that. And still I stood there with the coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is not an emotion. Forgiveness is not an emotion. I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of the will. And the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Help, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand to the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulders and raced down my arms, sprang into, into our joined hands, and then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, my brother. I cried, I forgive you with all my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. Those are incredible words by Corey Timboom, an incredible woman. In Romans chapter 8, Verses 1 or 2, we need to hang on this verse. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. Are you living in regrets, guilt, self condemnation, unforgiveness? It's by your doing, your own imprisonment, because look at what Christ has to offer. In Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 13, it says, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, on my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Here's Paul saying, I haven't arrived there yet, but I'm pressing on, forgetting what is behind, leaving the regrets behind. Think about the life that Paul had lived prior to his conversion, persecuting the church, persecuting Christians. A religious guy, but a lost guy. He said, and now I'm pressing on toward the prize, toward the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. You know what Paul is saying here? He's saying, forget about the past. Today is the day to begin to take the higher road. You have a higher calling. You have a God who sacrificed it all for you. 
He's saying, don't cheapen the gift. Don't cheapen your life by sacrificing and not responding and taking the higher road. So what's the higher road? The higher road is what Scripture tells us to do and be obedient to that and listening to the prodding and the leading of the Holy Spirit in us. But be careful. There's one last caution. You see, I just feel it's right in my heart. Scripture has something to say about that. You know what Scripture says about the heart? It says the heart's desperately wicked. Oh, thanks, Pastor. So sometimes, don't confuse what you think is really something that's happening in the heart with what you really want to do. All right, that's called manipulating God. Don't do that. So we start a new year next week, just a day away. Let's not forget about the ultimate gift. Over the last several weeks, I've invited you over and over and over to open the gift. And I know most of you in here. You know, I know a crowd that comes into church usually on a day like today. You're coming in because you're already convinced. But I want to challenge you, if you aren't convinced, if you're still wrestling whether the claims of Christ are true, I want you to accept that gift. It'd be awesome to be able to do it, you know, the, the last day of 2012 and say, okay, I'm starting a new life. I'm not turning over a new leaf. That won't work. You understand that? It's recognizing that Christ died for you and saying, I surrender my life to you. You died for me. I can't clean up my act. That's, that's when you're making progress. I can't clean up my act. I know that. Then you say, but you died for me and you took all of my filth on you. So I just give you my life. See the difference? Religion, remember where the word comes from? Re and ligio, to bind yourself back to God. That's what religion does. It tries to bind you back to God all the time. Christianity says, no. Nah. It's already been paid. It's free. It's grace. It's mercy. So if you haven't received it, I want to challenge you to do so this morning. If you have, and you're living in self-condemnation or regrets, today's a good day, the end of 2012, to give it to God and say, God, I recognize that I'm imprisoning myself. And today I'm going to choose to do the right thing. I'm going to choose to take the higher road. Let's bow together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the fact that you have, you didn't come to earth just to make us feel good, to make us leave this place because we've laughed and been comfortable and go out and say, wow, what a wonderful place to be. Father, we want to come face to face with you and with what you have for us. So my prayer today is that you allow each of us to examine our hearts, to throw out those things that are keeping us from the upward relationship with you, from the inward peace that you bring, and have frozen us from reaching out and caring for others. Father, take that away this morning. If there's a single person here that doesn't know you, may they just in the silence of their heart and mind say, Lord, I need you. I have lived in this prison long enough. I'm not going to do it anymore. I recognize that you have paid the penalty for all of my sins, past, present, future. And I've not received the gift of salvation that you're offering me. And today I want to do it. I believe that when you died on the cross, you paid all the penalty for my sin. And today, I trust you. I accept that gift fully and completely. I don't even understand it all. But today, I'm accepting you. 
I'm putting my trust in you. And Father, my prayer would be that uh, every person in this room has come to that place. If not, I pray that they will continue to seek you until they find you. Lord, help us to leave this place today, to go out, to make a difference in our community. Because we are men and women of integrity, because we take the higher road, we make the right choices, and we live a life of grace and truth to those around us. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, worship team is getting in place, so let's go ahead and stand, and we're going to sing. I'll be down front. If you prayed to receive Christ, or you want to talk to me about it, or need to just come for prayer, feel free to do so here at the end of the service. All right, thanks, everybody. for your greatness. We praise you for your great love and your wonderful gift. In Jesus' name, amen. Goodbye and God bless you. Hey, by the way, everybody, there's some uh, poinsettias down here. If you want to take them, I'm sure that we would love for you to take them home. Uh, take the real ones. Don't take the artificial ones. Uh, you can replant them. And also, if you want to come take one of these presents, you can get our head start on next year. I understand. I heard a rumor that there's a $500 bill in one of the presents, but I'm not sure.
She was down with Sadie, you know, Sadie from down in Marathon Way. She was down there for a night or two. Uh, I forget where the one to, but she was back <coughs> last night. But she leaves today. Yeah. So, yeah, she'll be hitting the road. So she's <coughs> the bag. <coughs> and then Mike, did Mike custom make it for you? Did he exact it? Oh, okay, that's, okay. Oh, the, uh, the other one I'm thinking of. Yeah. Yeah. You're blessed to have a very handy husband. She did la great last week, too. So, uh, you are blessed. You are. So, yeah, if you're around again and you want to play, see what all's going on. I don't know if there'll be anybody else. Happy New Year, Bill. If you come back for Easter or between now and then, I don't know. But um, no pressure, maybe if it's something you can do, let me know. Good, thank well, you. bless thank you, Kate. So, <laughs> thank you for using your life and ability for, for him and joining us. So, hope you have a good last uh, several days here. I guess you got most of the week. Yeah. 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 All right, thank you, too. All right, see you soon. Bye-bye.